Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, everybody loves a success story. Not everybody, but I sure do, because I think it gives people hope. You know, it's not just about weight. It's really about living your best life, health, and feeling great. And I know that if you're not familiar with my story. I was obese until I was 52. And the last 11 years have really been the best years of my life. And losing weight is hard, but it's not impossible because we like to feature people that have done it. And this guy, Jeremy Lalonde, has done it in a big way because he lost half his body weight, 160 pounds, and hopefully will glean some insights that will inspire you if you have a weight loss journey ahead of you, that you can do it. Please welcome Jeremy to the show. How are you? Good, AJ. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, well, can, you know, I, you know, you know, I, I just, I'm so interested in people that have been successful because if we can glean something that will help other people, I love to know what that is. But before you even tell us how you did it, tell us your story. Why'd you do it? How'd you end up big guy? Yeah, uh, just life, bad choices. Uh, you know what it was? It was for me. I think I, I'm a filmmaker. That's the other thing I do in my my day to day life. And so for me, you know, that's an all all consuming career, especially when you're starting off. And I, I you know, I didn't come from any contacts or, or anything in, in, in the film industry. So for me, I was just like, well, that's all I that's all I love. That's all I wanted to do. So I'm like every moment of the day, I just want to spend on that. And so I didn't focus on on my health at all. Right. And when I was in, in high school, I played football, too. And we played we played, you know, two or three hours a day. And so, and also, you know, combine that with being a teenager metabolism, I, you know, I could eat whatever I wanted to, you know, eat a whole pizza and it would just fall off because I was burning it off in the football field. But of course I stopped playing football in about grade 11, didn't stop eating the way I was eating because I was used to it. And then it just slowly crept up and crept up. And, and then my, you know, my work obsession just took over and just to the point where I was about 360 pounds at my heaviest. Uh, that's a lot. Of- How tall are you, Jeremy? I'm 5'11". So that's a, that's a lot. Yeah, it's it, it's not nothing. I tell you. <laughs> so did you have like like our, our other family members uh, overweight or obese? Like did did you see the genetics writing on the wall? For sure. Like my dad's a big guy and still is, and he he struggled for years with losing weight and gaining it back and has never had the success that I've had, unfortunately. And I don't think he has the interest in going the route I did and, and and others like ourselves have, unfortunately, much to my trying to guide gently that way. So I I definitely, I was really lucky. I didn't have that moment where the doctor was tapping me on the shoulder going, Hey, bud, like, you know, your levels are off, you know, you've got writing on the wall. So I, I just looked at, you know, my kids were, you know, toddlers at this point, And I just wanted to be able to keep up with them. You know, I noticed that I couldn't keep up with like a two year old or a three year old. And I was like, this is not okay. Like this, this is not the kind of role model I want to be for my kids, you know. And I always, I'd always kind of go at half measures with it. I'd join a gym and force myself to pay a year membership just to force so I'd go. And I'd make excuses to not go after three months, you know, just like everything. And so finally, I, I had this moment in time where I had like three months off until I was about to start a really big job that would like pay for my year. And so I was like, well, I can afford to take three months and just work on myself. You know, at this point, I was probably in my my late 30s, about five years ago. And I said, you know, what? if I spend the next three months and I just really, really work at it, I think, and I don't see any changes, then I'll just accept the fact that I'm going to be a big guy for my entire life. And by that point, I was already kind of vegetarian, pescatarian. You know, my wife has been vegetarian for most of her life. And so she was already eating that way. And then when we got married, I gave up everything except for like dairy and fish and eggs and whatnot. But as I started to look at my weight, I, I just started to look at other people for influences on other people that had had, you know, a significant amount of weight loss, because I knew I needed to do it properly. I needed to lose about half my weight in order to get to a point where I'd be heavy, healthy. So I looked at people like, I think one of the first books I read was like Penn Juliet wrote this great book about how he went on like a potato cleanse. 
to um to get his weight down he ate nothing but potatoes for like two weeks to reset his palate and then he uh worked with people like uh joel Furman. and then i got into like dr Furman and dr gregor and all those and just went down this rabbit hole and learning about you know the nutritarian lifestyle and whole food plant-based and I, I, I kind of noticed that I was just starting to wean these other kind of foods out of my diet anyway. And so by that point, I just decided to kind of go go full force with it, right? And say, I'm going to do it for six months and see how I feel. And, you know, I'm going to be active for at least an hour a day and eat clean. And after the first month, I lost 10 pounds. And, and, I, and without feeling like I was having to kill myself to do it. You know, so the weight just started falling off for the most part uh, with, with not as much effort as I thought it would be. And and not and I didn't feel deprived in the way I thought it would be either. You know, I call it my my long farewell tour from eating, eating kind of more of the sad diet. Um, but by that point, I, you know, I didn't have those cravings some people have where I'm just, well, I just can't give up cheese or, you know, my that that excuse people have about their iron levels and just, well, I just crave red meat, you know, for that. So you, you, your weight, it came on slowly because you didn't grow up overweight. No, well, I was, I was a bigger kid. And the only time I, I, I think I was actually in any kind of like fitness was in those years in high school when I was playing football, but I was still a big guy. I was like a linebacker, right? I was the center on the offense squad. So I was still a big dude, but it was like that, you know, that kind of healthy fat, they call it where there's like muscle right underneath it, you know, but it was still a, I would be considered a big dude still at that point, but it was just probably the healthiest I had been my entire life. But I was a big kid growing up. Like we had, you know, we had a soda fridge where there was like cases of pop in there all the time and we were allowed to have whatever we want. And I was a latchkey kid. So you'd come home after school and you'd be hungry. So you'd make a microwave pizza or a can of SpaghettiOs or whatever it was. Right. Uh, and my parents, and, and we weren't having the, at least in my community, weren't having the conversations about health that we have today, or, you know, the information wasn't the least readily available to us. So, you know, my parents thought they were doing a good job by making sure there was a slab of meat on my plate every night and, you know, a baked potato and some vegetables and that kind of stuff. You know, they didn't, they didn't know all the other things and also, you know, didn't push me to be as active as I needed to be. What did you ever try other diets to lose weight? Oh, yeah. Uh, when I was in college, I tried Atkins. <laughs> I remember just eating like a lot of salads with microwave meatballs. <laughs> inside. <of them. laughs> so I did the Atkins diet. I think I tried. Uh, I did calorie counting off and on. And I and, and I did start calorie counting when I started going plant based. But just because for me, I wanted to have like a knowledge of kind of the cost of food so I could figure out balance, you know, so I, I just could understand, well, this is what I can eat unlimited amounts of. This is what I should reduce a little bit and have a more balanced. And so I'm glad I did that. It took me a while to wean myself off of that. And there was, a, I went through a kind of a mentally destructive period where I got a little too obsessive with, with weighing my food and counting the calories. And I think my wife kind of like took me aside and was like, this has got to stop because it's, it's not good for you. It's not good for me and the kids. And I think you just need to like figure, she said, you've been doing this now for like a year and a half at this point, I was counting the calories and weighing food. She's like, if you haven't figured out the value of the food you eat by now, you're never going to. So just, you know, stop it. Just eat the balance that you know you're supposed to eat. And then let's see what happens. And, <clears throat> and to her credit, like I found like my weight started to go up a little bit, which terrified me. And I think anyone that has had that weight loss story, once your weight starts to creep up, it's just terrifying. But for me, like I say, I lost uh, half my body weight. I went too far to the point, and, and I can show you some photos that, that represent this in a bit, that I just got overly skinny to the point where people were actually concerned that I was sick and that I was <laughs> I was having challenges that I wasn't having. Because you kind of get addicted to weight loss too, right? Like you, it becomes a bit of a game. Like how, like I went from a double X clothing to a small size, which I never thought I'd be able to wear small in my entire life. And so that was like this little 
token of credit that I felt I had. And then I was like, well, I got to keep that small, small size where really my frame is not designed for a small size. I'm more like a medium kind of guy, but I just like that idea that I could say, well, I went from double X to an S, you know, uh, and, and, and that. And so I, as I started to just, you know, eat mindfully and just listen to my cues and when I was hungry and what my body needed at that time, I found my weight creeped up about another 20, 25 pounds past where I was at my lowest. But, you know, once I did my DEXA scans and all that kind of stuff, I realized, oh, I'm, I'm still in a healthy range. And actually, I'm a little bit healthier than I was when I was too skinny. Interesting. Well, it's got to be exhausting weighing and measuring your food forever. I don't know how people do it. No, it's well, it's just not it just takes the joy out of it, which I think is almost part of it, right? It's that idea because I do know that when I was, you know, you have to put every little thing in. So it does make you stop and go, do I really need this? Do I want to whip out the app? Is it worth like the 30 seconds or a minute it's going to take to enter for this in to eat these extra whatever? Uh, and so I think it was maybe good in that, but I just, I, I tell people now when I, if I ever coach anyone on weight loss, I'm like, do it for a month just to understand the value of your food and, and what, you know, as we talk about, like, you know, and you know, this as bad as, as everyone, you know, a tablespoon of oil is equivalent to, you know, an apple or a banana. And in my two brain, pound, two pounds of zucchini, actually. Yeah. And I was like, I'd rather have two pounds of zucchini than a, a tablespoon of oil, which my body isn't even going to recognize as inside of me, you know? So I, I was really grateful for that, especially when it comes to, you know, the nutrient density of food and understanding that. But like my wife said, it's like, once you do it long enough, your brain just knows it now and you can understand and you come up with other little tips like, you know, the fact that, you you know, the amount of nuts you can hold in your hand is about two tablespoons, you know, with a closed fist. And so I can just do that and know those little cues or you can look at something and know what that value is and, and looking at your meal and go, well, this is a balanced meal. I've got, you know, I've got some good fats. I've got some good proteins. I've got some good carbs in there. And, uh, and what's my delicious sauce? And we're good to go. Nice. Well, it must be a lot more freeing now not to have to do that anymore. Well, that's just it, you know, and it's not that I don't give myself a little treat every now and then, but it's all like within the program and the community of still being plant-based, um, you know, and, it, and, and, the, and those rare occasions where I'll have something that might have a little bit of oil in it or whatnot are just that it's like, it's a little treat. It's not, you know, it's one of those, it's one step to the side just to enjoy something and then to get right back on program, you know? Yeah. How long have you maintained your weight loss so far? Uh, so I think I kind of hit around here, I'd say almost four years, three or four years. I've maintained it without much effort other than I eat. As it says in the, the title down there, I, you know, I'm able to keep the weight off eating whatever I want because the trick to that is you have to change what it is you want to eat, right? And the way I want to eat is, you know, whole food, plant-based, oil-free. And so when you eat that way and you're eating a good balance, you can eat as much vegetables as you want. You can eat as much fruit because by the time you're, you know, you've eaten too many calories, your body's just full, as you know. Absolutely. Wow. So what's been the best part about losing weight? I think just feeling like I've, I'm in control of my health for the first time in my life, you know, that I feel like there's, you know, my future is boundless in terms of just what I can do, you know, being able to run upstairs, keep up with my kids uh, and, and, and be a bit of a role model to them as well. My son's 14 now and he wakes up every morning and he does a workout with me. You know, he's starting to get into high school sports and whatnot. And so, you know, that's been really, really fun for us to like have that little, kind of collaborative, competitive nature of, of what he's doing. And, and he's now trying to keep up with me, you know, so I started to lose the weight so I could keep up with my kids, but now they're trying to keep up with me, which is kind of fun to see. Nice. Are they, is everybody in the family on board with whole food plant-based? Pretty much most of the time, I'd say our kids eat all the stuff that we eat. Um, we've never wanted to demand they eat a certain way because I just find that just leads to rebellion eventually. And so we've always left that to themselves. So all the meals we have at home are whole food, plant-based. 
they're welcome to, you know, if we go out to eat and they want to have something that has a little bit of dairy on it or whatnot, we don't stop them from doing that because we think they have to make the choices themselves. And so, so we've always been fine with that, but nine times out of 10, they, even we went to a family camp uh, a couple summers ago. And after a week of eating that way, we're just, there's more oil in the food and everything. Like by the end of that week, they were just like, I just want vegetables. Like <laughs> they came home and they just craved the way we normally eat. Right. So I think they, they always return to this and they have a really good base in this that we feel good about that and that they're going to make good choices moving forward, even if it's not always 100% on the same plan that my wife and I are. What did they say when you lost weight? And I mean, obviously they noticed your wife and kids. Yeah, 100%. Like my, uh, they were pretty young at the time. And so for them, I, and I also just wanted to have that, them to have more memories of me being healthy than me being unhealthy. Uh, and because I remember like, make them making little weird comments about daddy's big belly when I was when they were little and they do it in a cute way that was never like disparaging or mean but it's, it's, those are the comments that just they hit a little deep right when they, when they walk away and you're like okay this is this is how they view me right uh and so it's interesting like you know your family never quite praises you to your face right but it's more about here when you hear them talking to other people and whatnot and I know especially with my wife like my wife loved me no matter what my weight was, you know, she's always been a pretty uh, fit person herself. But, you know, I think she saw it as a great benefit that I was starting to just be more active and healthier. Uh, and and she just knew that I had to do that myself. I, you know, she was never going to be the person to push me and tell me I had to lose weight or whatnot, right? That's fantastic. Was it difficult to change your diet in terms of like, did you have any cravings? Were there things that you, that were hard for you to give up at the beginning? I thought there would be like, I thought, cause when I first started to lose the weight, I was still eating um, like eggs and whatnot. Right. And I found that I liked like two hard boiled eggs that I'd make in the instant pot and a banana for breakfast. And there was something about that. I thought I'd always eaten eggs growing up, but once I just stopped, I never really missed it at all. I thought I would miss cheese. I haven't, I haven't missed any of those kind of things. I think, you know, my son, the one time he was a little upset at first because we used to go out for sushi and have like sushi dates, he and I, and he thought that that means that we had to, that had to end, you know, that no, we wouldn't you can have... make great sushi without fish. That's just it. I was like, buddy, there's a whole vegetarian vegan menu on the sushi. We can still go out and you can have whatever you want to have and I'll have what I want to have. And you know, and I think that's it too. I read this great book by Jonathan Saffron Fior called Eating Animals, I believe it's called. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you read that book. Uh, and he has this great chapter in it talking about, you know, a lot of the problems people have with food and changing the way they eat and their families are, are because there's so much like family history with food and this idea of acceptance and culture and memories. And so, you know, when you say you're not going to eat certain things anymore, people take it personally, even though it has nothing to do with them, because they think it means that your their relationship with you is going to change. Uh, and so that's, that's been a big thing we've done with our families too, is like, you know, none of my, my wife's family has been amazing. Like her mother and her aunts, when we get together at holidays, they just eat plant-based like we do. Um, and it's great and they love it. But when I go to my side of the family, like they're a very small town and they like to eat the way they eat. And so for us, we're just like, we bring our own food. We don't make a big deal out of it. We make enough for other people to try it, which they always do uh, and rave about it. But we just make it about other things than food. So that way it doesn't have to become an issue, right? Right. Tell me about your YouTube channel. I watched a few videos. There are lots of fun. Yeah, um, it all, that all started just because as I was losing all this weight, I had so many people asking me tons of questions and I found myself having the same conversations over and over again, which I didn't mind having, but it also made me think, well, if this information isn't as readily available as I would want it to be, maybe I can put it up there in a way that's kind of fun and interesting. I think a lot of the times, you know, information about health and especially, you know, being plant-based or vegan can come off either a little bit dry or holier than thou. And I wanted, I wanted to see the approach that I wanted to see when I started doing this, which is like something that had a bit of fun to it and had a bit of lightheartedness to it. 
and this acceptance that, you know, you know, perfection is the enemy of the good, right? And that you, you know, all of this stuff will meet you where you are, and it's okay to take baby steps with it. And so we just wanted to have fun with it. And and just, you know, last year, the family started to get more involved in it. And we started doing things like uh, reviews on on plant based and vegan cookbooks. And so one of the, the things we do on a regular basis on the channel is we'll take a, a, a cookbook that oftentimes someone in the audience has recommended, and we'll just cook from it for an entire week. And then at the end of the, and then the kids give very honest reviews, sometimes painfully honest. And then at the end of the week, I let the the viewers know whether or not I think the book is worth buying or borrowing or maybe putting it away. So that's one thing we do. And then, and then information videos, I do a lot of that as well. Just like talk, I have a video coming up this weekend about uh, gut health, right? So I, I try to make a, a fun video about your gut. So you'll see me doing things like making some probiotic rich foods, um, trying out uh, a supplement that a company wanted me to take a shot at, and, and then just generally talking about what goes on inside of your gut and trying to break it down so it's accessible and doesn't just feel like homework for people. Mm. Well, somebody that's watching live named Anne says she watches you on ca Canadian television. That's right. I um, part of how the YouTube channel started too was uh, there's a, a small channel. Uh, Bell is one of the big cable providers in in Canada, and so they have their own TV shows that they make, and so they commissioned me to make a plant based cooking show. Nice. So you can only see it if you're in Canada, though. Well, the beauty is is that um, because they're a small broadcaster, their their exclusive window on those episodes is very short. So most of that content is also on my YouTube channel as well. So when you see the YouTube videos of mine where it's in a very nice farm kitchen that's shot very, very well and not just handheld like me in my kitchen at home, that's all the stuff from my uh, my Canadian Bell 5 show. Um so it, the, the YouTube channel is kind of a blend of that. That's a bit more, you know, film-esque looking and the stuff that's a bit more off the cuff. Nice. People are asking for the name of your YouTube channel. It is in the show notes, but you can also tell us. Yeah, it's uh, PB with J, which is um, plant-based with Jeremy. But what I, what I liked about the PB with J title is it also obviously alludes to peanut butter and jam, which is a vegan staple that people can eat, you know, and it's, it's, it's comfort food. It goes down easy. It's familiar. And so for me, I thought that was an interesting way to brand the channel around this idea of like, you know, plant-based food that is comforting and fun. Nice. Everybody always wants to know this, whether a person has lost weight or not, even when they're not vegan, they get asked this, what does Jeremy eat in a day? I know you have some videos on that. I sure do. Uh, what, what, what's my, what, what did I eat today? So I woke up this morning and I had some two slices of whole wheat sourdough that I made myself with some natural peanut butter and some homemade chia jam that I made yesterday with uh, a green smoothie that was like bananas and mangoes and ginger and some kale, which was, and that was my breakfast this morning with a little bit of protein powder in there because I did a big um, muscle workout with my son. So that was, but mostly most, I'd say 90% of the time, my breakfast is some form of oats, either uh, oatmeal or granola or like an oat bake. Uh, you can check, I just posted a video yesterday of showing me how I make my oat bake. So you can see that. So some form of like oats with fruit and nuts and seeds is nine times out of the 10 what I have for breakfast. And then lunch is typically leftovers from the night before. Um, or a can of lentil soup <laughs> with a slice of whole wheat bread um, and then some fruit on the side. And then dinner often, I mean, you can see what I eat for dinners because a lot of the times it's the stuff we're making for the videos. Um, and so it really, you know, we try to do, we try to balance it in our house where one week we'll shoot stuff for the channel for doing a cookbook review. And then the other week we just, we let the kids completely decide what they want to eat and they haven't had in a while. So that often it, it shifts around, but it's like, you know, usually once a, a week we're having some kind of Mexican dish 
Uh, and, and the way we try to do a lot of meals with the kids in the house, because we've got one kid that's very adventurous and one kid that's really, really picky. And also my wife and I have slightly different different palates as well. So what we try to do is do different styles of food and create what we call a bar. So okay. we'll do like a pasta bar or a Mexican bar uh, or a Greek bar. And so we'll make a whole bunch of things and then you can kind of build it however you want. You know, so that way, if you don't like mushrooms, like my daughter will not eat mushrooms, she can leave the mushrooms out, you know, or if you don't like the pesto sauce, my wife, tomatoes don't always do well with her. So she'd prefer a pesto to a tomato sauce, right? But the kids don't like the pesto all the time. So just having all those kind of things that we can also just leave in the fridge or freeze and rewarm up later for quick lunches and meals is a really, really good way for us just to be make make meals that everyone can like mildly customize a little bit. But yeah, most meals are bowls. Bowls are really big. Um, stir fries, because, you know, you can use any vegetable you want in that. Any grain goes with that. A lot of these in meals that you can just easily switch around. I did this video a couple months ago that's like a compilation of sauces. And in that, we talked a lot about all the different uses you can use for these sauces. And so, yeah, it's it, it's a little different every single night. But um we also try to keep it adventurous. I, I never wanted to be that person that just eats the same three things over and over again, which is part of why I like doing the cookbook reviews too. Because even if it's like chili again, it's like, well, yeah, but I haven't had this person's chili and maybe I'm going to learn something from the way they do this or this technique or using this spice versus that spice. You know, it, it just keeps us on our toes and it helps us kind of change and develop our own recipes. That's so cool. I agree with you, you know, customizing, do it yourself. I mean, that's why these restaurants like poke restaurants and bowl restaurants are so popular because people like having what they like. That's just it. Right. Um, and, you know, I think our, our kids have always been good about being pretty adventurous. We always say you don't have you don't have to like the meal, but you have to try it, you know, and if you don't like it, try to be articulate and let us know why. And we'll try to make sure there's always an option there for you. And our kids are old enough now, they're 11 and 14, that if they don't like what we're making for dinner, that's fine. There's the kitchen. Make something for yourself. There's always enough stuff in the fridge and whatnot that you can make some kind of a meal. How often do you think they actually do that? Okay. <laughs> uh, on the weeks when we're not doing the cookbook reviews, uh, usually never. But the weeks we are, there's been times where my kids are like, not eating this. <laughs> They'll take one bites and my daughter's like, I'm going to make sushi rice and get some cucumber, and I'm going to make myself a little sushi bowl. Great. Oh, here's a fun question uh, from Julie. She says, her kids enjoy watching your videos, and what are your family's top three dinners that you make if I'm looking for new kid-friendly recipes? Yeah, uh, I would say taco soup, which is something we make in the Instant Pot, and I have that recipe. That recipe is definitely on the on the channel somewhere, but it's definitely on my website, which is just pbwithj.ca. Uh, that, for sure, it always goes over well. Pad Thai always goes over really, really well, um, and that's something that is like my wife's go-to recipe. Um, and you can, and it's great because we just load up the vegetables and we'll switch it out based on whatever we've got in the fridge. So it's a real kitchen sink kind of meal. You know, it's usually cabbage is the main vegetable there and then whatever else you can add to it. And then I would say like a barbecue bowl. So what we'll just do is we'll just grill a bunch of vegetables um, and we'll grill tofu. And, you know, sometimes my son wants a Beyond Burger or something like that. And so we can do that on the on the grill too. And they just have a whole bunch of different vegetables. And then we'll cook either, you know, use your brown rice with that. And then, you know, some like uh, some kind of a barbecue sauce over top, a homemade barbecue sauce or a store-bought one, if you can find one that's fairly healthy. Um, or even just like a pesto would be good over that as well, right? So a barbecue bowl. I, I Here's the real trick to cooking for kids. Get them in the kitchen with you. Anytime a child is involved in preparing a meal, they're that much more likely to give it more of a shot than they would if it's just presented in front of them like they went to a restaurant. You know, when, when people invest their time in making something, they're more inclined to, to, to enjoy it or to try it, right? When they know that they've put some time into this. I agree. 
they got some skin in the game. That's just it, right? Yeah. Because what are they going to say? I made this and it's terrible, you know? <laughs> and sometimes I admit that too, you know, especially when we're cooking from other people's cookbooks and I try not to preview it too much because we just want that honest reaction that, but then we play that game too. It's like, okay, well, how do we make this better? And they have to play that game. Cause I've tried to teach them enough about cooking about like, what are the different, you know, types of flavors you've got, you know, your umami, you've got sweet, you've got sour, you've got bitter. It's like, okay, what does this need? What's it missing? And my daughter would be like, it needs some lime. It's missing an acid. So she went into the kitchen. That's what she did last night and grabbed a lime and sprayed it all over the bowl I made her. And honestly, it made it that much better. Nice. Let's see. I saw another question. And do you eat more fixed meals or do you tend to graze? Oh, I try... See, that's one of the other things too, is like, as I was losing the weight, I tried all these different, like, I, as most people do at some point, you just kind of plateau your weight loss kind of stalls a little bit. And so I would start doing things like intermittent fasting, which I still do to some extent, you know, I try to stop eating after dinner or like a, a small dessert, and then I won't snack again until the, the next day. So I don't do a lot of grazing during the day. I find like between breakfast and lunch, my breakfast fills me up so much. I'm not usually hungry until around 12, 30, one o'clock that, that day. Anyway, I find that I probably start grazing around four or four 30 where I'm getting, starting to get thinking about dinner um, or starting to make it. And so when I do that, uh, I will try the typical thing, I wish this wasn't the answer, but the typical thing my wife and I will usually grab is like some popcorn mm. because it's just, it's, it's light enough. We'll make a little small bowl of popcorn uh, that, or I'll try, you, you always have like a big bag of snap peas and baby carrots in the fridge. So usually I'll grab a handful of that. Um, so if I'm grazing, it's usually, it's usually just that time of day when you know, I'm smelling the food. I'm starting to think about what I'm going to make and my stomach is starting to turn on. So I try to treat it less like grazing and more like an appetizer <laughs> meal that's about to come. Do you, do you cook the popcorn yourself? Often. Yeah. Yeah. Usually we have like uh like one of those hand crank things that we put on the stove that um, I usually don't even need, like if I put just cause it's getting old, it might need like the smallest amount of, of coconut oil just to keep it going. But usually I try to get it going on its own without it. Um, and, and the one popcorn we will buy sometimes here in Canada, because it's pretty good. It's very, very low in oil and it's plant-based. It's called Skinny Pop. And there's another one called Chicka Boom Boom, I think. But I think you guys have that in the States as well. Chicka I think Boom. so. I've, see, I've seen them both at the store. Yeah. And they're pretty good. They're pretty good for like on the fly if you're in a pinch, but we, we tend to make our own often. And I just got this awesome dehydrator. So I've been making kale chips, mm. uh, which well, I used to try to make them in the oven. I never quite liked them, but the de dehydrator changes the game. Such a different, that's why when, you know, when people say, well, can I make it in the oven? You can, but it's not going to come out the same. They, they, they come out like, like fall leaves. When you crunch them, they come out dry and crumbly in the I just don't feel like a, an oven can do dehydrated recipes to the degree that you no. enjoy them. Right now in the kitchen, I got what I'm making. I've never made it before. I'm doing experiments called cauliflower popcorn. Oh my God. That sounds amazing. And no, no oil. Aquafaba. Wow. That sounds like a lot of fun. Do you, do you try to strictly avoid or avoid as much as possible things like sugar, oil, and salt? hundred percent. Yeah. Like I, I try to like oil is my last resort always. Cause I always just keep some aquafaba in the fridge. And my motto is like, if aquafaba can't do it, then I don't want it. <laughs> you know, it's pretty rare. The only time times I've had to slip is a little bit, if I'm in someone else's kitchen and they just don't have all the stuff I have. And then, but even then I'll try to ask myself, I'm like, could I use a nut butter instead of, could I, is there any avocado? Is there another fat here that I can use for this oil? Interesting. You know? I'd like you to talk a little bit about how your skills as a filmmaker combined with what you're doing now. And I'd like to know a little bit more about you as a filmmaker, feature, documentary, what what have you done? Yeah, so definitely I think my approach to the to the, the YouTube stuff is just I just know you know it's the old Mary Poppins quote, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. I it's got to be entertaining, you know, it's got to be fun to watch. It's got to move along in a bit of a clip. 
Um, and, and so, you know, because I have all those skills just in the back of my head, when I'm making these videos, I just know instantly if something's going to work or not, if I need to get another shot. So I think, you know, the videos have, a even though most of them I shoot on my iPhone, uh, have a, have a pretty decent production value that way. Uh, and, and also just knowing there sh should be a variety, right. Um, and there should be a rhythm to it all. Uh, yeah. And so it's been really fun to combine like my new love of like cooking and, and, and plant-based with my filmmaking skills into what I'm doing on the YouTube channel. It's almost like it's been building towards that without me really realizing it. I think if you told me, you know, 20 years ago when I was starting off in the film industry here in Canada, that, you know, some of the greatest joy I would get in filmmaking is doing plant-based material with my family. I might've been a little, I might've called you a liar, but uh, I work. So the, the, the stuff I've worked on here in Canada is mostly in the comedy realm. I worked on, um, I've, I've directed seven feature films that uh, have all been released in the States. So um, the current film I'm that's about to come out sometime, I think this fall is called Daniel's Gotta Die. Uh, it's like a, it's, it was Bob Saget's last film. I got to work with Bob Saget just before he passed away. Um, but I've also done a lot of TV stuff. I worked on a TV show that traveled across the border called Baroness Von Sketch Show. And it was a, a sketch show. As you can imagine, it was four women. And I got to work on that um behind the camera both as a as a director and as an editor and work with those four viciously funny women um so yeah and 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 but I've done a little bit of everything when I started my career it's just that in the same as anything you just do whatever you can to pay the bills and to learn your skills so I've um you know I've worked in documentary I've worked in corporate video I've worked on you know cooking shows as an editor particularly um, but now I've, I've, I'm kind of lucky in that I've been able to do a lot of my own work recently uh, and, and a lot of it from home, which is great. You know, I think the pandemic forced a lot of that anyway, where people were able to work from home more. Um, even over the last summer, I worked on a, a sitcom for here in Canada, but it was I was working on on it as like a kind of comedy consultant and editor. And I was able to do it all from home and over Zoom and whatnot which has made it possible for me to be home for my kids when they come home from school and to be, you know, kind of a stay at home dad, but also like a filmmaker working from home. What's your favorite genre to work on? Oh, you know, I'm, I'm working, like I've always done comedy just because it seems to come naturally, but I'm starting to branch out and, and, and play around a little bit more. So I just did a psychological thriller about a year and a half ago, and that was a lot of fun because I got to test my skills a little bit more. So for me, it's more about just kind of continually pushing myself in new directions and, and, and finding new things. I'm, I'm still on the hunt for what the next thing is going to be. But uh, yeah, right now, it's just about really playing and exploring. I feel like I've ticked off a lot of the boxes I wanted to tick off in my career. So now it's just about going, well, what else can I try? Neat. Let's see. Oh, you know what? We should have done this like in the first five Photos. minutes. Okay, I know. Right? It's yeah. I enjoyed talking to you. The uh, the proof of the pudding is in the. So let me. I'll, can you see this? If I put that up there. Wow. So that would have been me, probably in my mid twenties, um, when I was pretty close to my heaviest. This is me. This is after I won a uh, Canadian Screen Award, which is like our version of an Emmy. Oh wow! So this would have been. I think this was in two thousand seven. I want to say. And this was around that time too. So, so this is definitely me probably around my heaviest at around 360. Um, and this is at our farm. This is Christmas morning, I believe. My brother-in-law grabbed the camera and took, this is my favorite photo to show people because it's, it's the photo I hated myself the most. <laughs> it's like, I got my tongue sticking out. I'm just, it's the least flattering photo ever. <laughs> uh, so I love it. And this was this was literally right before I started to lose the weight. We went to Disney World and my daughter was, I think, four or five. And of course, her little legs wouldn't carry her most of the day. And I just realized, I'm like, I can't carry my daughter around with me for more than 20 minutes at a time without me just being winded. You know, so I think coming home off of this trip was when I was like, I got to I got to mm. change. Right. Um, 
And so, and this, and this is as we get into like a before and after. So this would have been the year before I started losing weight is like the first obligatory first day of school photo of me and my kids. And then this was the next year. So how long, what a difference. So that's, that's the difference. That's I, obviously I'm that guy. You look, the thing is, is you look older in that picture. Yeah. Well, weight will do that to you, right? Just yeah. like fatigued and tired. So that's a year. And probably that right there is the bulk of the weight. I lost the bulk of the weight in about a year. So seeing that there is about 160 pounds gone. That's incredible. I mean, not everybody does it that quickly, especially females, but yeah, that's amazing. And it was, there's no pills, there's nothing like that. It was just continuous and being really strict. But then, then I started getting to the point where I got a little too skinny, right? So this is us at the farm too, digging, digging our vegetable, par <laughs> vegetable, uh, farm. And then this is definitely, this is, I think where I get into my skinniest and my clothes look like they were falling off of me. <laughs> uh, this is me at a, a, a film festival party in Toronto. Uh, and then this is one of my favorite photos of me and my, my, old, you asked if I had any, any old, old clothes. I think we've gotten rid of them all, but oh, this you didn't one, even keep that one. Cause you could probably get in one leg now. I, I could do it then for sure. Uh, and my kids like to do that too. They would both get in one leg each. <laughs> That's, I hope you save that one. That one, I think we still have somewhere. Good. But, um, but that Good was the that where I was like, oh, this is, this is my Weight Watchers photo of me, <laughs> of me with my old. And then, yeah. And then now it's just stuff now of, nice. uh, and my daughter's grown, obviously. She's even bigger now. She's a beast. Wow. And that's my wife, Emily, or as the people on our channel know her, Wooly. Uh, and then, yeah, and then that's, this is another example of like a photo. This is me four years later at the same award show winning a different award. And so that from Amazing. where's this photo uh, there. Yeah. I love it. I love looking at these. Yeah. So inspiring. Look how handsome. Oh, thanks. I clean up. Okay. My gosh. How nice. Strawberries. I yeah. It's my favorite fruit. Strawberry. Oh yeah. Yep. I'm a raspberry person. Oh, congratulations. I mean, I don't pick any berry. You give me a berry, I'm a happy man. Congratulations, Jeremy. This is extraordinary. Do you ever, either now or in the last few years, felt afraid that you might gain some or all of it back? And if so, how did you counteract that fear? You know, I think I definitely did once I started um, just not counting the calories, not thinking about that. And, and, but I think I've just been lucky. Like I, 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 my system is that I weigh myself once a week, Wednesday mornings, you know, after I go to the bathroom, stark naked, I jump on that scale. And, and cause I found that I was weighing myself every day. And I think the fluctuations just mess with your head too much. Well, yeah. Dr. Lyle says there's no useful information in that because no. yeah. So I was like once a week, Wednesday is a good, I like Wednesday because I think, you know, everything I had read was that Friday mornings, you're usually your lightest um, because you've gone the whole week and maybe you've been good and you've exercised throughout the week. And then usually Sunday nights, you're your heaviest because you maybe let yourself go over the weekend. And so I was like, well, if that's the case, maybe Wednesday morning is like a good middle point. So I'm not like diluting myself and being a lower weight or, you know, feeling upset that I'm a slightly higher weight. And so I just weigh myself Wednesdays and I find, honestly, I'm within the same one pound range mm -hmm. you know, without having to really police myself. You know, if I make a little dessert and I want a, a slightly larger portion one night, I let myself, if I feel like my body wants it and needs it, I let myself have it, you know? Um, and I think the other trick is I just always find, I try to find as many excuses as possible to move in ways that are natural and that I enjoy. And so if I need, if I forgot something from the store, uh, I'll either walk to the store to get it or I'll ride my bike. You know, I try to oh, avoid yeah. using the car as much as possible. If I do drive somewhere, I park as far away in the parking lot as I could can just to get those extra steps in, you know? Uh, and, and just that kind of stuff. And if my kids want to play basketball, I always say, yes, I'll, I'll drop whatever, even if it's work, just to get a little bit of extra movement in there that doesn't feel like exercise because it's fun. 
Nice. So, so do you do you you just do something every day to stay active? Is what I'm hearing. Yeah. So, well, I get up in the morning. Every morning, I do some kind of a focused workout for about twenty to thirty minutes, uh, and it ranges between just doing like muscle, uh, bo- mostly body weights, or like I have resistance bands. You know, nothing crazy. I'll do that, or and it's all stuff that I find on YouTube. You know, all my all my exercise gurus are YouTubers, um, or I'll do uh, power yoga is another thing that I do on a regular basis. Uh, and I used to do a lot of hit when I was losing weight, but I don't think I actually like it <laughs> because I find it's it's harder on the joints. And so instead of that, I just we have a dog, so I'll walk the dog twice a day for like at least a half hour. Put a podcast on that I like to listen to, and and it never feels like it's that's a chore either, right? So yeah, and just moving as much as possible and 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 whatnot, I think is is really the goal. Yeah. You mentioned that like if you were good on the weekend, we we like to say, you know, not good or you know, Dr. Esther always corrects people when they say that and say it's not good, not bad. You either were health promoting or health compromising. Hmm. So then it doesn't take the judgment because then people, if they eat something that they think of as bad, then they think of themselves as bad. Yeah, no, I never do that. I just I, I think whatever I, I think there's something in my brain that tells me it's like, you know what? You should go like you should make that walk with a dog 10 minutes longer. You know, I just kind of like find I autocorrect in those kind of ways. I just my my body just like is now programmed to correct for balance. Right. And I think that's all it is. It's just balance. It's going there's no right. There's no wrong. Just make sure there's a balance there. And if I, you know, <clears throat> if I know I'm going to have like a bigger treatier dinner, like I know, like tonight we're <clears throat> my, you know, we don't do it very often. But tonight my family is going to order Thai food from a, a place that we really love that. You know, when we ask, they'll reduce the oil for us and it's all plant based. But I know that. So I had a lighter lunch today, had a lighter breakfast, walked a little bit more. Nice. Here's a comment from Andrea. She says she loved the video where you made the meal for the group and would love to see more of that. What what group did you make a meal for? Yeah. So I um, got roped into that by my cousin, Roxy, who works for this charity called Michael's House, which is this great charity here in Canada that helps single mothers that um, either need help with either finding jobs or housing or whatever it is that they're struggling with. And so they auctioned off kind of a a cooking class with me where I would cook for a a dinner party for them and allow whoever wanted to from the dinner party to help out. And so my son came and videotaped that with us. So that was just a group of people who don't typically eat plant-based at all. And so it was really great because they asked such great questions. And so I was able to answer questions for them that I think the audience asks as well. And it's definitely something that it's going to become a regular fixture on the channel where it's, it's, I'm going to call it in addition to like the, what I eat plant-based uh, cookbook reviews, it's going to um, be called cooking for carnivores, um, cooking plant-based for carnivores, but it's going to, we're going to do a couple of different ones. I'm going to do one with um, a friend of ours. That's a teacher who needs quick quick night meals. So I think my trick to that is always going to be finding a different kind of person that has a different need. Um, I'm going to do one with my, my aunts. So cooking for seniors, uh, cooking plant-based for seniors and doing that. So I think we're going to try to do one of those once a month, once we get started on those. So that'll be coming soon. Cause I just find it's fun too, you know, and especially I, I find it's like, it's one thing to cook someone a delicious plant-based meal. And have them go, oh, I really like that. But it's another thing to stand back and be like, you do it. I'll tell you what to do. You know, get your hands dirty and play and whatnot. And so for that dinner party, it was great because I made, uh, you know, a chocolate tart using silken tofu. And so for them to just, and, and you know, the, the crust was just made up of pecans and uh, and a little bit of coconut sugar, right? Because uh, the pecans were, you know, they, they pressed themselves together and, and we made... Um, I, I call it clamless chowder soup. So it's like a, a, a clam chowder soup, just using tofu and whatnot and uh, and made um, like a walnut cauliflower taco, like a, a Thai. Well, I, you know, I did the taco. You guys did it on the channel here with um, Plant Pure Cookbook, the uh, that Thai taco she makes. So I did a version of that with peaches instead of mangoes. And so teaching them how to like use cauliflower and walnuts and then different spices to create whatever flavor base they wanted to was something that I think they they really, really took away from it. 
So Barbara has a question because you had mentioned a few times aquafaba. What is that? And also, are there any substitutes for aquafaba other than oil? Well, aquafaba, uh, for those that don't know, is just the juice that's left over from a can of chickpeas. So if you buy canned chickpeas, you know, when you go to empty them, do it over a strainer and a bowl and then keep that stuff, put it in like a mason jar or whatever you want in the fridge. And you can use that to do so many different things. You can use it as a replacement for oil. You can use it as a replacement for eggs in baking as well. You can use it to make whipped cream. You can literally just whip it up the way you would eggs, right? And what's really cool about it, you want to add some, you know, some sweetener to it. But what's awesome about aquafaba is you can't overbeat it the way you can um, when you're making whipped cream with, da with dairy. Because uh, it just keeps on getting fluffier and fluffier and stiffer and stiffer, right? So there's so many uses for it. And if you make your own uh, chickpeas from dry, you can keep that liquid too. The only thing you have to keep in mind is often people put more water than they need to. So it's a bit thinner. So you just got to cook it down. Just put in a pot on the stove and just boil it down until it's kind of like a, like a stew kind of consistency where if you dip your, your spoon in it and you press your finger along the back, a, a line should form in the spoon and the, the liquid shouldn't over whatever, you know, move over top. There should be like a clear line that stays in the back of the spoon. And that's about the right consistency you want. But yeah, you can use it as like an egg wash too, on top of if you're baking something and you want it to have a little sheen. I'll use it if a recipe tells me to make like French, like French fries, you know, as opposed to tossing them in oil, I'll just you know, take a teaspoon or a tablespoon of aquafaba, drizzle it over and toss them up. And I'll put that in and I find it gives a similar layer of crisp. That's great. Somebody's asking, do you ever cook a healthy poutine? I guess that's a Canadian dish. Very Canadian. So poutine traditionally is the most unhealthy food you can have, which is what most of our high school students are raised on. It's French fries with uh, cheese curds, and beef gravy <laughs> and that's a traditional uh poutine is is the way it's pronounced here but most people just say poutine sorry i just no that's <laughs> okay we we typically say poutine as well but poutine is like when you when you hear someone say poutine you know they're like they're a real montrealer oh my um, gosh so i've i've done a healthy version of it i did it with one of the cookbooks i did i think it was plant-based deliciousness where she did um kind of a healthier version of a poutine, but my kids weren't buying it. They're like, cause she was using brown rice as opposed to potatoes, but for sure. So what I would do to make that now is, you know, French fries, I would bake them as opposed to frying them. I, we have this delicious mushroom gravy that we make uh, over the holidays. And I don't think I have the recipe on my website yet, but I'm going to put it up for this holiday season. Um, and then for the cheese, I would probably just use the cheese that I, I make all the time, which is mostly just made from cashews, not cashews, I'm um, sorry, uh, carrots and potatoes and like nutritional yeast and tahini. And I would drizzle that over top and then put the mushroom gravy on top of that. So, you know, that's, that's kind of what I, I always aim to do is find a food that I loved back when I used to eat very unhealthy and find a way to make it healthy. That's fantastic. Here's a comment from a viewer. Uh, I don't know where to go. Here from Tabitha. Thank you for your show. Your family is great. I really enjoy it. And it's super motivating. And Stephanie says, have you influenced anyone else to this way of eating? Yeah, I've had a number of friends that, um, you know, some have gone full plant-based and others um, definitely do it a lot more than they would have. Um, so one of my, my wife's, uh, aunt eats this way, I'd say at least 90% of the time, you know, I remember when I was first starting to go this way, she would just ask me a lot of questions and I thought it was because she was being nice, but then I realized, oh, you're picking my brain because you want to do this. So her for sure. And then, then a number of our friends, um, have, have asked me, and I always find that's the thing I, I get now. I used to get questions about like, you know working in the film industry or some of the celebrities I've worked with and whatnot. But now I get people asking me about recipes and it's like, Hey, my kid, I want to, I want to, is there a healthy way to do this? You know, or what, what would you do if you were trying to, had to feed someone this? And so I find that's the conversations I'm having now. And I just nerd out so much about it. I just get really excited about like the game of like, Oh, how do I turn that into this and doing those swaps? 
is like my favorite. If there was a game show where I got to be on it and do that would be my favorite thing ever. Oh, my, I love it. I would love that too. We could, I would love to be in a competition, cooking competition with you. That yeah. sounds really fun. Do you think you'll have a book one day of all your recipes? I think so. It's definitely something a couple of people have asked me about a, a lot recently. So it's something I'm going to look into. I don't know that world. So I've got to learn a little bit more about it and get into it. But nice. I appreciate that people keep on asking me. I think it means that there's 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 uh, a hunger for it. That's cool. Hey, um, oh, I was going to ask. But, oh, no, no. Well, I, I don't, don't you hate it? Oh, yes. So I don't know what it's like in Canada, but in, in the United States, like when there's a project, whether it's film or television, there's something called craft services, you know, that they feed the crew. Is it as unhealthy in Canada as it is in the United States? Uh, yeah. Sure it is. Uh, I mean, it can be. I mean, I think it's I've definitely noticed a shift over the last couple of years. Uh, and I know and I'm lucky enough that whenever I'm on set now, it's, it's as a director or, or as a producer. And so I, I have a bit more leverage. So, you know, one of the things I'll always talk about in prep is that I'm like, there needs to be options for everybody. Um, for not only the meals that we, you know, when you when everyone breaks for lunch and they serve a shared meal, but also just at the craft services table as well. It's like, you know, and 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 that and that, you know, obviously that includes people like me who are plant-based, but also people that are gluten-free, people that have other, you know, dietary restrictions or 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 beliefs and whatnot. You know, I just think it's not it's not okay for to not be able to feed, and it's not that hard. I always I, when I, I teach film school as well, and I always tell them, I'm like, make Mexican food. It's naturally gluten-free. It's so <laughs> easy to make it like vegan. And you can make it like in a bar kind of thing where if you want to have some ground beef for those people who insist on it, it's great. Just put things in little sections. and can make, people make all their own things. So yeah. I think it's the kind of thing that can be unhealthy. But I think, you know, there's been there's so many conversations now about health and people are so much more hyper aware that I think those places are getting a little bit healthier. Because the people that work on those shows just want better options. I know for me, like uh, in, in Ontario here, there's a lot of filming that takes place up in, in Sudbury in northern Ontario, away from Toronto, because they have tax incentives allowed to do that. And I'll tell you this, I've shot a project, two projects up there, and they have a really awesome film festival up there. I call that the unofficial vegan capital of Canada because there are at least five or six amazing vegan plant-based restaurants, which is there as a direct result of the film community going up there and spending more time there and being and more like-minded people demanding that kind of food. And they have this amazing place in Sudbury called Tuco's Tacos that I was just there two weeks ago with my daughter came to me for a film festival and she's looking around at how packed that place was. And she's like, the people that are in here, dad, don't look like people that you would associate typically with like plant-based or vegan. And, and, and she's right. And I said, that's because the food's just good. And when food's good, people don't care what's in it, you know? Um, and that's the distinction. I think, you know, I'm sure you've come up with this and people watching this have too. It's like, you know, I think whenever people that aren't used to eating the way we eat, when they think of like, plant-based or vegan meals they just picture what they eat and they take the meat off and they assume that what's left is what we eat you know where it's not that's not how it really works like we you know we're more bowl oriented or we fuse things together and whatnot um it's just a different type of way of eating but it's just there's no it's no less delicious than any other way of eating if you're open-minded to it yeah. the films that you said are your projects that we can see in the united states what platform can we find them on they're all on iTunes. So if you just go to iTunes and type in Jeremy Lalonde, you'll see the the seven different films that I've made come up on there. Um, and so uh, some of the I'll give some of the titles. Some of the titles are a bit racier, so maybe I'll leave those for people to discover. Because I, I made some sex comedies early in my career. Oh. Um, so uh, the more recent ones are James versus his future self, which is a time travel comedy about a man who is desperate to go to the future and having to learn to live in the present. So it's like a a metaphysical uh, time travel comedy, um, a, a psychological thriller that I made last year called Ash Grove, which is up on there. Um, and then the, the the sex comedy I made early on in my career is called Sex After Kids. And it was about just being a young parent. 
Wow. I, I would like to see that. Comedy is my favorite genre. So okay. there's a question from a viewer named, where did it go? Yes. Karen says, ask about Annie's salad dressing. <laughs> okay. This was something Annie, this was one of those nights when Annie refused to eat her, her dinner. And so she went and made her own salad. And, uh, and I think she slyly told people that if they, if like 5,000 people liked the video, she would give away her salad dressing recipe. So it's coming. We're going to put it into a family favorites video. Now, what is it? What is it like? I mean, what are the flavors that people? The, the sad truth is when I told her that that many people were asking for it, she's like, I don't remember what I put in it because, oh. but she'll be able to figure it out. If I show her the video, she'll look at it. And know because what I've trained the kids on is just understanding that to make a good sauce. And I talked about this in my sauce video is just hitting those different components, which I'm sure AJ, you know, like the back of your hand is like, you know, an acid a sweet, you know, a, a, a fat and a salt, right? And if you have three or four of those categories, you'll make something out of it, right? So she just runs around the kitchen going, I need a fat. Okay, almond butter, you know, uh, and then she'll throw mustard in it, you know, and then she'll, and, she'll, and then they're always delicious, right? Because they're ticking off all of those boxes. So if I had to guess the salad dressing she made that night was a combination, usually her base starts off with, balsamic vinegar, almond butter, and mustard, and then she'll play fast and loose with the spices. <laughs> cool. Oh, it sounds great. Something to look forward to. I don't know what this product is, but somebody's asking uh, what uh, Diana's saying. What do you think about the Walden's marinades and dressings? Oh, you know what? I usually make my own things like that. So I don't tend to buy those things. So I'm not, I think, I, I think I've heard of the brand Walden, but I, I can't speak to it at all because I've never used it. Okay. All right. No worries. And here's a question. What has been your favorite cookbook so far? Whoa, good one. Oh, wow. We're going to do at the end of the year, we're going to do like a top five or a top 10 of all the cookbooks we've liked so far. Um, I think I, I really, really enjoyed the plant pure one for sure. Cause I think that one just gave me ideas and, and ways of looking at certain meals that I hadn't thought of before, like doing the, those Thai tacos just kind of blew my mind a little bit. Um, I always really, we haven't actually done them on the channel yet because we've already cooked from them, but I really love Angela Lind Linden's books, the Oshi Glows books. Um, there's another woman uh, called Sam Turnbull, who's a fellow Canadian. She, her website is called, it doesn't taste like chicken. And, and it's all like plant-based comfort food as well. And, and I'm also a big fan of the, the two, the duo that does bad manners it used to be called thug kitchen. And they have a new book coming out this fall too, that we'll be reviewing. So those are some of our favorite cookbooks, but I think if I had to think of off the top of my head, which my favorite is that we reviewed so far, I'd probably say plant pure would be in the top five, if not higher up great yeah it's a great book she was actually supposed shout to be on shout the out show. to kim campbell yep right she was supposed to be on the show last week and had to next week and had to cancel but hopefully she'll be on soon well what fun getting to know you I, everything you've told me is in the show notes but just verbally where do you like to send people to connect with you the most yeah so check out the youtube channel obviously it's down below um if you want to check out our website pbwithj.ca that's where we have all of our recipes are on there. Um, and if they're not there now, they will be soon. And through that, you can uh, get on my mailing list, but also on that website are all the links to all my other socials. So like Instagram and Facebook and all that kind of stuff. So if you, and, and the YouTube link is there too. So if you want just one place where you can find all the stuff, uh, the website pbwithj.ca is probably your best bet. Right. Thank you so much. It was so nice getting to know you. Oh, you too. Thanks, JJ. My pleasure. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back at 11 a.m. tomorrow for Plant Fuel with Dr. Nikki Davis. She's going to be making recipes that we tasted at the recent Plantrition Conference, but she's going to be making 